Hello and welcome to the Think Lit. Uh, fuck me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Alright, you know what? Okay, I'm just gonna keep it. Yeah, I'm your host, Mitt Romney. <laughs> Woo! Boy, that was an intro, huh? Alright, well, <laughs> that's per usual. The Think Liberty Podcast is part of the Think Liberty Podcast Network. Uh, you can find us anywhere that you normally listen to podcasts. So that includes iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, things like that. If there's a platform that you listen to that we're not on, try to reach out and let us know. And we'll see what we can do to make sure to get on that platform. Uh, you can find us on most social media outlets just by searching for us on them. So just go ahead and search Think Liberty. And again, if we're not there and you'd like to see us there, try to find a way to reach out and let us know. And we'll see what we can do about getting on those platforms. Um, just as we've been saying, also, we are still doing this, uh, you know, $15 shirt sale that we've got going on. So for a limited time, we offer these shirts for $15. And then after that limited time is over, they go back to $20. Right now we've got this uh, fight for your rights boxer kind of shirt to go with the fight for your rights theme that we're rolling with right now. Last week we did the uh, Donald Trump space force and these are all available on Amazon prime. So you get that little shipping perk to go along with it too. All right, let's get to this episode's guests this week. Joining us his majesty, it's back, Joshua Smith. What's going on? I'd prefer Overlord. Thank you. Gotcha. And how have you been, Overlord Smith? Oh, I'm hanging in there, man. It's been uh, it's been a wild year. <laughs> Happy yeah. to be back. Yeah, yeah you've been you've been doing a couple things. Yeah, I did one or two things in the last mm-hmm. eight or nine months, and I'm happy to be home with my Think Liberty fam. Hella, that's gosh darn right, and we're happy to have you, buddy. Episode forty. It's going to be a hoot. You also got Caitlin joining us. Caitlin, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Happy to be back on the podcast. I, I think I missed the past couple weeks. Oh, you think? Just shows how important we are. You got something kids staying up or something like that going on. Yeah, crazy life. Yeah, that's right. All right. We're also joined by Lonnie, who uh, actually just got a new drone. How's it going, Lonnie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I tried to... Um, I tried to uh, film. Can you hear it? Can you? <laughs> I tried to film a speech in Venezuela, and people thought I was trying to blow up Nicolas Maduro. Right, you've seen and, it on the news. Yeah, it, it just went bad, and they shot it down with a shotgun, and I lost all the footage. So <laughs> the last shotgun shell in Venezuela. The Venezuelan government owes me about seven hundred and fifty dollars. Or about <laughs> which Venezuelan that's money. That's a huge like international dilemma. In, it's just bad news. In Venezuelan <laughs> money, that's like forty billion dollars or something like that. So <laughs> you should check out wish dot com. <laughs> they got some cheap stuff on there. I mean if you're just gonna blow yeah, it up, so. you know, you might as well. Other than that, other than that, I've been good. So Well hey, that's good. I like to uh like to hear that you're staying busy, buddy. Also joining us this evening is Killian Hobbs. Killian. How you doing tonight? Doing well, doing well. Uh, not anything as exciting as, uh, you know, recording a bombing accidentally, but uh, other than that, I'm doing pretty good. I'm surprised that I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that they have uh, Wi-Fi in the igloos up there in Canada. Yeah, it's uh, really weird, eh? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the last episode, you tried to track the first half of it from a fucking Tim Hortons parking lot. <laughs> Good it's the most God. Canadian thing ever. Yeah. Oh, just going to go down to the grocery store there. Eh? No, it was a nightmare. We had 15 minutes of listenable audio that came from two and a half hours worth of trying. At a certain point, we just kill Just drive home, dog. Just go home. We will wait. We'll start back up when you're at a, at a reliable internet connection. Then I'm, I'm eating in case anyone was wondering. Meatballs this time or? Mm. No, it was some delicious turkey tuna. I don't what know. The turkey if, you can't, <laughs> if you can't identify the meat, I don't know if you should be eating it, man. It was it was definitely turkey. It was a turkey green bean casserole thing. No, that sounds uh, that delicious. Came out, of, came out of the crock pot. It's really, really good. And um, yeah, I just got done with the 12-hour work day. So. All right. Yeah, got to eat. You know, turkey tuna. Important. Sometimes you forget. That's I understand. Good. 
Yeah, but at least it's not the Venezuela episode. That was pretty great because we're sitting there going on and like, <laughs> why is it that no one in Venezuela can afford to eat? And you're like yelling <laughs> 10 feet away with the, with the meatball sub stuffed in your face. Hey, those were some good meatballs, If you listen man, you closely no to that episode. Like you couldn't even hold on like five minutes to finish your meatballs because you had to yell about socialism. <laughs> that was the best part. Yeah, I think I yelled across the room too. That's how bad yeah, socialism makes me like, it makes me that mad. Like, like, I'm so mad at socialism that I have a mouthful of meatballs. I'm standing across my entire house. And I'm yelling at my microphone. Socialism sucks. <laughs> They're barbecuing it's zoo that animals. Mental association. You're like, I'm eating good food. If we had yeah. socialism, I wouldn't be eating good food. And that's yeah. that immediate like set off of being angry right there. I just I hate socialism so hard because it sucks. <laughs> so there's hard, so baby. many other reasons, but I'm just gonna say it sucks right now because. I don't know if you guys know this. I'll be debating the socialism versus capitalism thing in a couple Oof. of days. So we'll save we'll save it for then. We'll save it for then. Mm. Godspeed, friend. Yeah, I'm not really going to argue from like I'm not going to argue from a philosophical. See, he's going he's going to expect me to be like all philosophical about it and be like, no, nah, dude, just stop stealing things. Like that. That's that's what you want. You want to steal people's shit, and you shouldn't be stealing from people. It's not ethical. Now, now you got to do something else because you just said what you were uh, what you're going to do, right? No, it's going to be it's going to be a lot cooler because I have like these. I had, well, listen, let's let's not act like Mike Shipley listens to our podcast, okay? <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, like a girl can dream, okay? <laughs> you can take away many things from me, but you can't take away my dreams. Anyhow, um, on this episode, we're going to we're going to frame stuff just kind of like we were. we're. We're doing our fight for your rights campaign still. And if anyone has been <laughs> if actually if anyone's been listening. Oh, my God. To the, <laughs> to the Are you podcast. Okay, Vin? Vinny smoked way too much weed today. That <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I. <laughs> No, so look, we normally we've got like a schedule, right? There's this this certain way that we go about uploading podcasts. Certain podcasts go up on certain days, and so Thomas and William are doing a, a bunch of great work. And they they recently went from doing just audio to doing video now too, and they forgot to dump some of the um, the audio from the videos they've been doing onto the podcast feed. And we reminded them, you know, Hey, you might want to go do it. So they dumped like five episodes just ran on one Friday, just <laughs> oh, Jesus. front loaded the whole thing. One at a time, gentlemen, one at a time. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, this content, it's not like a, uh, use it or lose it kind of deal. You can, you can front load it. Yeah. You can schedule it for another time. Went from Liberty bites to Liberty three course meal. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It was a full on a liberty. Yes, a smorgasbord of liberty. At any rate, they're covering a lot of really good stuff. They're covering the Constitution. They're covering the Bill of Rights, and they're doing it in, you know, Liberty Bites in these short segments. And they're doing it when they sit down and drink scotch and talk about stuff on the Liberty on the Rock show as well. So definitely check those out and get into them. You'll see a cluster of like five or six episodes there recently. You should you should listen to them all. So on this episode, we're, we're going to talk about discourse and specifically libertarian arguments and not just, you know, how to make libertarian arguments, but how to handle libertarian arguments. Um, you know, like we had talked about before on a Liberty Bites episode that I had recorded, there's a lot of times that libertarians allow themselves to get put into a defensive mode. And so on this, we want to talk about not only how to address it with good arguments and argumentation, but something that Killian actually referred to as a sword and shield uh, discourse methods. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit, Killian? Yeah, that was what I was uh, referring to earlier. So basically, one of the biggest issues that we run into when it comes to debating liberty or anything like that is that we're constantly on the defensive. But when you th- like, you got to think of it in a sense of almost a fight. You don't win just by blocking. Just the same, you don't win only by striking and leaving yourself open to any kind of counter strikes. You need to be able to kind of block and hit at the same time. So I'll use the most overused, painful example of you know, who will build the roads or something like that. Instead of going on the defensive and trying to explain yourself and setting yourself up for another attack, another question of, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? You need to be able to strike back with, well, in a free market situation, the community would be able to pick who is going to do the road. They'd get a cheaper service. They'd get a better quality for the service for that they paid for. So a real question is what justifies you taking my money to do a piss poor job at it? Being able to 
answer the question, block the question, and then flip it back to them so that they have to stay on their toes as well. Yeah, speaking of piss poor job, let's look at San Francisco. God, driving around in San Francisco is just an absolute nightmare. Josh is familiar with this. God forbid that you you miss your turn and then you're going to spend the next 45 minutes trying to find out how to get back to where you were supposed to be in the first place. It's really weird to hear that it's hard to go left in San Francisco of all places. Yeah. You think that going left would be like no. a really easy thing there. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. You, you got me there. No, the, the just the planning, the whole city, like everything is just done horribly, you know, and you got these like trolley cars that, and they, and they go alongside on the roads, but the cars aren't allowed to like, you know, occupy those lanes. So it just, it just turns into a big mess. You know, I mean, consider this, San Francisco is like incredibly congested with people traffic anyway. So there's, there's, there's people all over the place all the time walking everywhere and everyone, be it on, on the ground, in a bike or in a car, on a scooter, whatever, the last person they are concerned with is you and what, what's going on with you in your car. And if you don't just kind of get out there and get in front of people and, and get on it, then you're just going to sit parked all day having everyone drive around you. Well, did you... <laughs> Hey man, well, do you I, I, I uh, I know how do goes. you remind them that they need to stay like a certain how many car lengths is it like three car lengths behind you because it would decrease the chance of an accident by ninety percent? Can, can you say can you say lengths one more time? Well, lengths, lengths. All right. Anyway, oh. all of that totally lengths. goes out the window anyway in San Francisco. In San, <laughs> in San Francisco, it's just pretty much you, the, the get where you got to get do it faster than someone else can and, and just drive for your life. Cause if you don't, you're, you're not going to get anywhere. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've been there. It's, it, but here's the thing. So I've traveled all over the country. I've driven a lot of other States now and like it, it got me ready for non offensive drivers. You know what I mean? Like, cause people are oblivious everywhere you go, but like in, in San Francisco, everyone's so like offensive at driving. Like, you know what I mean? Like they're always on the offense. Like they don't care like to be defensive they're always like they're gonna go first like you could you go out to, to texas or oregon or washington and they 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 don't know how to zipper it in when they're you know merging they don't nothing you know we mer- we merge in san francisco at like 75 miles an hour <laughs> you know yeah all done on a road that has a speed limit of like 25 miles per hour too yeah they don't do that other places. Everyone slows down and stops and it creates all this crazy traffic. If we did that back home, like there would be, it would take us five hours to get anywhere, everywhere we were. Well, y'all are the ones that are advocating for anarchy and in anarchy, there would be no speed limit. So that's the preview of exactly what you want. Yeah. But in anarchy, then yeah, it'd be great. You know, maybe it. someone planned the roads that have two fucking brain cells to rub together. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit of a difference there. But yeah, San Francisco's a mess, man. The zoning laws make it impossible out there. It's the whole West Coast. Yeah, yeah, but the, the only thing you can do is build up, and even then, you, you can't even do that much because if what you're building gets in the way of someone else's view, you're, you're boned. Literally the whole West Coast is like that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a mess. Well, the best idea with like an anarchy road would be that if it's private road at that point and you drive like an asshole, you're on private you're property. I'll shoot your fucking tires out. driving on my road like an <laughs> asshole. We're getting McNuked. That's one That's solution it. anyway. Lonnie, Lonnie, get the drone. Get the drone, Lonnie. It's the most logical solution. Right. Well, okay. So on the topic of anarchy, we're, we're talking about that. And so I actually wanted to start with this. So, I, I, a lot of times in debate and in discourse, people come at this and if, if they are anarchists themselves, you know, if they consider themselves ANCAP or any other stripe of anarchists, they oftentimes try to handle debate and discourse from that position. And it, and it doesn't always do them a lot of good, right? Like, because while you may have found anarchy and that makes a lot of sense to you, a lot of the people that you're going to be talking to love government, right? They can't wait to go vote for Gavin Newsom and they are super duper pumped on all the policies coming out of Jerry Brown. <laughs> right. Right. So, I mean, you know, it, it can oftentimes be counterproductive to hardline the anarchist principles when you're talking to people that are really far removed from that kind of philosophy. You know, a lot of these people are single issue voters and it does you well to kind of focus on single issues and get get principles of liberty through that way. You know, even me. Right. Like so when when I was brought to this and when I was shown these things, um, you know, libertarian philosophy and ideas by uh, but Josh, actually, 
<clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> right. Well, look, I found I found where I ended up myself. Right. You gave me the the, the stuff to start with and the places to look, and then I took it from there and, and and kind of decided where I was comfortable and what I believed in. Oh yeah. Well, that's how it works. You know, it's all it's it's our it's our journey. You know, you can't. I I didn't come to you and say, "Hey, man, you're a statist, and you need to start." getting rid of the government today. Like, it's not how I, it's not how I approached you about it. I said, Hey man, you want to come into this libertarian group that at the time was like a, a pretty moderate libertarian group. Yeah. Sort of, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't full of anarchists. It was, you know, there was some bleeding hearts. There was some left libertarians. There were some anarchists and, and it was kind of a cool discussion zone for you to learn, you know, the, the, learn the answers to the questions that you had. And I think, you know, once you really got into the philosophy, I, I saw you, I mean, you, you went light years ahead of me on like economics and all that stuff, you know? Um, but it it's, yeah, it's, it's up to everybody. It's everybody's journey. You just have to give them the tools and you have to make sure that those tools are something that are something that they can digest. You know what I mean? You, can, you can't just throw uh, human action at them and say, Hey, read this book to them and get back to me next week. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's hard to do, you know, it's like, it's like throwing Adam Smith at him, you know, it, it, it just can't, you can't really do that right away. You gotta, you gotta talk to people in a way that they understand. And that's the most important thing to do as libertarians. And I, I talk about this all the time. You know, we, we have two ears, one mouth and, and we forget that as libertarians quite frequently. Um, Larkin Rose is actually here in Texas this weekend doing a, um, some kind of, you know, talk about how to talk to people, how to get people out of their status thinking. And he, he did this thing where he, you know, he put on the fedora and some suspenders and he got this girl in front of him and started putting her, his finger in her face, calling her a statist. And, you know, that's as libertarians, a lot of times that's what we do. And it's not how we should be doing things. We really need to break people in a little easier. Yeah. And especially ANCAPs, you know, I hate to throw my own under the bus here, but you can't expect everyone else to be an ANCAP, you know? Vinny's being really nice. You guys are socially awkward. Stop it. Mm, You're still being nice. (laughs) Awkward. I wonder if some of these guys aren't on the spectrum, right? They got to figure this out. You got to be a little better. You're, You're socially awkward. Can you stop it? Seriously, shave your neck, take the fedora off. And, and start saying, hi, my name is, and I want to talk to you about something. You know what I mean? Like not, oh, you're a statist, blah, 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 blah. And can you guys start treating women's better? Can we do that? Is Please. That, is, can we do That'd that? Be great. Can we, can we start treating women better in the movement? Women's. Listen, this is not me like calling for identity politics. Can we just be nicer to ladies? Because it's important. No, it's true too. You see Caitlin jump in sometimes on these debates and she'll leave like a, like a poignant comment and someone just like, shut up, cunt. It's like, whoa, whoa. It may not have been necessary. <laughs> My favorite is when they go, oh, you just don't understand, sweetie. I'm like, what, bitch, what? Oh, no, that's the worst. Oh, that's it's even terrible. worse than when they call me a cunt. It's great. That's like a, that's like, since now that I'm living in the South, I see it. Like, like people like, oh, sweetheart. That's not a good thing. No. That's not a good thing. There's something bad when you're, when you see someone saying things online and it's just online. It's, it's text on a screen, but you can automatically smell Mountain Dew and Cheetos. Like it's just, it's, it's a bad time. <laughs> Listen, you guys are my brothers. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm trying to give you sound advice. Stop being neck beards. We have more important things to do than sitting around and calling people. Most ankaps in caps are horrible. Like at discourse, oh, they're just straight to you know status cuck. Like that's well, the, yeah. well no, the, but but here let's. This is the thing. There's ancaps like me and Vinny who are we're like voluntary ancaps, and I've started telling people that I'm a voluntary. So I don't even tell people I'm an ancap half the time because <laughs> there's this whole other movement of people calling themselves ancaps. You know, like the uh, chase for shells of the world who are horrendous people. They're not good people. And they're, you know, there's always this like constant fight for the heart and soul of like certain philosophies. And like, we can't let them have that. But at the same time, like it's hard to associate with that moniker after seeing those people start taking it on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I've got to the point where I don't even mention what I am or what I claim to be. I just start talking about Hayek. Exactly. That's, that's, that's what I do. Let's get into it. I'll just start reciting something from the fatal conceit or the road to serfdom. 
You're going to be a surf and you're going to fucking yeah. like it. <laughs> yeah, an- 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 such are, a fucking shit. Like, I- I've talked about this before. It's just ANCAPs. It's, it's just like, I, I will actually ask them. I'm like, can you please just stop talking? You're you're embarrassing me. You're undoing the work that I'm trying to do. You know, because <laughs> I'm not even sure if it's ANCAP. So I think it's just libertarians in general. Because like, minarchists are pretty bad too. Because like any thread you're on, they're just be like, well, I'm a minarchist. Like they just they yeah, have to like, say hey, that. Matt Murphy. And- we're looking at you, Matt Murphy. Yeah. Matt's funny because he's like, listen, I'm a minarchist, but everything should be voluntary and I don't believe in central government. But also I'm a minarchist. Yeah, he's so funny about that. He's so hilarious. Because like I see him advocating for this anarchist shit all the time. And I'm like, also he like the hardcore minarchist when we started this thing? He still worse, is. It's just, I don't even think it matters. Like it, it's all semantics at this point because he has a different definition of anarchy versus minarchy and it, it's hard to get down to, you know, the root of it. Yeah. Yeah. Just as long right. as you're not working with uh, Derek's Oof. definition of uh, anarchy, then, you know, if you use a crosswalk, you're uh, that's, that's government. Who are we talking Derek about here? James. There, yeah. He's, he's a good oh. guy. He just, uh, is our government, Derek James. Yeah. yeah. He had that debate against Martin and he, uh, he made some arguments. Yeah. I remember that. No, there's there some other people that are like that too. Uh, I just, I just got to hang out with Patrick. Smith the other night I was I actually did a show with him and we're, we may do like some kind of like normal scheduled show but he's wait, like wait, very wait, wait, very wait, wait, hardcore wait, wait, wait. hold on before you uh, go do another scheduled show just yeah, show yeah. up to this one on normal oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> no and that's and that's my goal is to be able to be on this one every Sunday now as well and and we, I talked to him about maybe doing a, some kind of partnership I'll talk to you guys look listen we don't got to talk business on the podcast okay yeah. no it's good I'm proud anyways. of you just just do your other podcast <laughs> just do this one first anyways anyway so we sat down and he's a hardcore voluntary so I love the guy to death he's great but we're talking about you know uh, the the governor candidate the gubernatorial candidate here in Texas um and he Mark Tibbetts, if you're not familiar, he just won the, the nomination. With, <laughs> that's so good. And the, the, the lieutenant governor, his, his last name is Kerry and it's open carry. It's so good. It's so good. Anyways. Um, so Mark won the nomination by six votes here in Texas to Corey Watkins. If you're familiar, who was pretty voluntary. Um, Patrick Smith was also running at the time. And uh, so we had this big philosophical discussion where he's saying, you know, listen, I can't vote for somebody who's going to call for any kind of taxes whatsoever. I said, look, Mark Tippett wants basically only wants a small tax to fund education. That's it. Now, to me, it, cutting that, you know, 30 percent of my taxes to 5 percent, you know, like I'm going to vote for that because I feel like we're moving. We're moving in it's the right direction. Yeah. Patrick Smith won't. Yeah, Patrick Smith won't vote for that at all because he sees that as still voting for authoritarianism. You know, and and I think that we get caught up in that so frequently as far as you know libertarians and and especially voluntarists that we need to remember that we live in a society right now that doesn't support our views, and so if we ever want to make those views more of a reality, we need to take the steps to get there. And that's just how it's go- that's how it's become. Because I know me and Vinny used to talk all the time about pushing the Rothbard button, but I wouldn't. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I would do it right now if I could, but you know, the 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 country would murder me before I got to the button. You know what I mean? And we need to figure out how to stop uh, stop that. You know that that thinking. Yeah, it, and it, it's tough for me because like, I see and I, I respect and I appreciate the 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 really like kind of pure hearted anarchist libertarian arguments and the principles but the frustrating thing about it is is that you know like we were saying earlier you know people will get to their own conclusions and stuff like that on their own time and and what you tend to see is when people can experience the benefits of liberty and and of freedom they want they they're going to want more of it right they're going to try and find ways yeah. absolutely yeah, they're they're going to try and find ways to get more of it, right? If if something happened and someone just all of a sudden got ten percent of their paycheck back, they're going to look into why they're getting more of their paycheck back and and what they can do to get a larger percentage of the money that they've earned, you know, get given back to them. It's not necessarily like it has to always be all or nothing, right? Well, that's I used to work. For, I worked for the federal government. I was in the military. You know that, right? Like there is this like this constant mindset in in the federal government we have to spend this money 
or we won't get this money on the next budget year. Right. Like, like that's how they think about it because they know that if people start getting their own money back, they're going to want more of their own it's money back. Nature, and that's how it works, yeah. you know? And that's, and it's, it, yeah, absolutely. Well, and on the, on the flip side, that's happening, you know, like when I lived in Portland, you know, they're so used to giving more of their money to the government to, to fix things. I just did air quotes. If you guys right. know, um, right. They, 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 they're just so used to that, that they just continue to vote themselves in the new taxes. You know, we had a roads tax instituted two years ago and it was found out that that money was getting funneled into pet projects and bike lanes. It wasn't even helping the roads. Right. And so people were irate about it. Irate. But they didn't end. They didn't end the roads tax. So what? What, the, what was the government's solution? They they proposed a, ta- a gas tax to go to the roads. And what did the people? I, I was like, here it goes. Here it goes. They're gonna they're they're gonna be pissed. They're gonna vote this down. They're gonna start to understand. No, they voted themselves into a gas tax. The people of Oregon voted themselves into a ten cent per gallon flat gas tax to go to the roads when they were already paying a tax to fix the roads that was getting well, bundled didn't, didn't to pet projects that, and bike like, lanes. That blows the my only mind. way things get done is if the government does I, it. I have, I actually have a good uh, right. analogy on that. <laughs> or dominoes. Or the porno. government <laughs> treats problems like a loser in a strip club. They keep throwing money at her thinking that she's going to sleep with them. And it's not going to happen. So what do they do? They just keep throwing money, keep throwing money, keep throwing money. And it ends up becoming a waste because their dream does never becomes a reality. The government spends money like a loser in a strip club. So we, we need a bouncer to kick out the government. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm calling the government Bob from now on. That's it. Bob, you need to get a job. That's that's what libertarians are. We're the bouncer. We're the we're the strip club bouncer and we 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 need to get rid of Bob. We need to get rid of Bob. Yeah, we do. No, so you know, here's the problem, right? Like I just voted here not long ago. Um status. Oh, shut up. But I just, I just voted not long ago and there was, there was a measure on there and it was basically talking about, okay, we got all these problems in these local areas with the roads and the infrastructure and things like that. So we could either, you know, raise taxes this way and then put that money toward fixing infrastructure or, or you could just do nothing. You know, that's, that's the alternative. You could either pay the taxes to get the stuff done to fix the infrastructure, or there's, there's nothing else on the ballot that could be done. Right, so that the people are essentially left with the choice of, okay, well, we can either take state action through taxation to pay for this thing, or nothing can get done at all. And that's the binary that people's brains are set in. Domino's is like, hold my beer. Which is pretty rad. I'm still surprised they can get away with that. I would have assumed they wouldn't have been able to get away with that. Like, I, I feel like I remember seeing news articles with people going out and trying to fix potholes on the roads and, and they were getting in trouble. For yeah, it. Like, like, how is it illegal for me to go fix the road in front of my house? How can that be illegal? Like, think about how dumb it is that I just went and fixed the state's fuck up and now they're fining me. Like, just think, just think about the idiocy behind that. And and then think about the people. It's for public safety. That's how they write off all well, of those course, laws. Of course. Well, the, the, the reason why is because that pothole requires an engineer that is the mayor's nephew. And so he needs to make $50,000 on the design of how to fix this pothole. And then this other person, you know, they need to be paid for their job, which is, you know, contacting and finding the right uh, concrete and asphalt um, company. And so then they have to have the person whose job is to take the bids and all this kind of stuff. And that pothole ends up costing like $100,000 to get, quote, fixed. And then in two years, it's back to a pothole again. Careful, I'm going to be sick. <laughs> and then you I, just, I, I literally you just, just repeat that process over and over. Yeah. I actually puked twice. So. But that is legit how these things are done. You have to have an engineer. That's because if it was done without the proper uh, channels and stuff like that, like how do we know this is even done safely? You know, it, it's it's just big mess. And 
but that's, how safe, that's how they how do How safe was it when, I, when you run, run through it and, and it pops your tire at 40 miles an hour? Then it's unsafe. God bless Domino's. God bless Domino's. God bless Pornhub. I say the same thing, but for different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they got they got Pornhub in Canada? Can well, for sure, eh? Like, what? what? <laughs> oh, my God. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to this next portion here. I want to bring up some topics and, you know, you feel free to just kind of throw in any, any ideas you have that fit this, this kind of context. But, and I don't only want people to walk away from this, knowing how to turn a conversation where they're put in a defensive position uh, into being one where they can be on the offensive. But I also want to hopefully give people some things that they can walk away from and take as argumentation in their own discussions that maybe are things that they don't have in their um, lack of a better term arsenal of argumentation right now. So since we're on the topic, we can talk about roads, roads. right? Yes. The roads. So, you know, everyone talks about this and they go on about who's going to build the roads and, and what's <laughs> what's going to happen with the roads. And uh, you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is in most situations, the state doesn't build the roads now. Right. They're a middleman. They pay someone else to build the roads. So saying who will build the roads is kind of silly because someone that isn't the state and in most cases already does build the roads. It's just a matter of basically who's going to be able to find a way to pay for the roads, which is a completely different conversation. And all of that completely ignores the fact that are, are we going to sit here and pretend that there's there's absolutely no business case to be made for roads? No, no one wants a road. There's no reason anyone might want to drive on a road. There's no monetary incentive toward making sure that people can drive on roads. I'd argue that there is. Right. And so it, this one's kind of foolish. It's kind of silly to just assume that without the state, all of a sudden no one needs a road and no one. Everyone apparently forgot how to build them. Yeah, no, that, there's definitely people out there willing to pay their, for the road, especially if you give them 30% of their income back. Right, that thing. <laughs> and it's it's not always about citizens paying for the roads. There's other ways of going about it. Like if a company is going to build a you know building for their company, they're going to need to make sure that people can get there so they have a case to build that road, and it wouldn't be like a citizen or taxpayer funded, you know what I mean? And then you have other models of like ad sponsorship, like Google could make a highway and they get, you know, advertising on it. Obviously they get to put their name on it. It's good for, you know, public relations, that kind of even, thing. Just like, they even, do in the like a, even in a smaller town segment, right? You think of the downtown core of most, not like major cities, but how oh, hell even major cities, all of the businesses along the way are going to want people to be able to reach their businesses. I'm pretty sure we had roads before we had income tax. Oh yeah. Especially in the United States. I mean, the income income tax wasn't instituted until 1913 with the uh, creation of the federal reserve. And we still had fire departments and police and roads and all that stuff. Surprise. So surprising, isn't it? But they did everything at at a local level and a state level and, you know, I think people voluntarily, you know, most of the fire departments were run by volunteers back then. Still are. People were like, hell yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's the crazy thing, you know, but you're paying for it. I, my favorite argument that I like to make with people that kind of, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, red pills them or whatever, is I always talk about the post office. I love the post office argument. It's one of my favorites because people are like, well, we're, what are we going to, what are we going to do about welfare? We got to make sure we have a safety net for people. I'm like, I really like private charities. And they're like, well, people don't, people don't want to give money to charities to help people. And so I like to, I like to say, look, if I was the president of the United States, I would treat every government department like the post office. You know, we, we opened up the market for competition in the post office and within four years or less, there were so many awesome services that were more efficient for a cheaper price that if the post office went out of business tomorrow, no one would care. I haven't been to a post office in like seven years. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I like, I like to, I like to talk about it in like, in those terms, I like to say, you know, I would, I would open up the market for, uh, you know, uh, competing business, especially in, in the charity industry, because right now 
something like 90 percent of charities are regulated out of the market in their first year and these are people who want to do this philanthropy work these are people you know that they want to turn a profit but you know like they're not the red cross who has a 70 percent overhead you know and and they're regulated out of the market and then they shove the red cross down our throats no i want to open the market not regulate you know these great new charities out of the market and let them build up you know a, a pipeline of charities that help people in need and they'll do it more efficiently for for a cheaper price and the people who need help will get better help we know that because the government sucks at everything it does just go to any dot org website no this is good this is good this the topic of charities this is a good one because a lot of these times when people there's stuff that goes on that people don't really realize or maybe they don't pay enough attention to, but there's a lot of these stories that come up when these organizations will go out of their way to be charitable and they're stopped from doing so by the state. You know, how many times have we read about a church that tries to open their doors in for whatever reason to feed the homeless or give them somewhere to sleep and they're stopped from doing so by the state or when, you know, this is one of the left's favorite things to, you know, meme and say it was the fault of capitalism. But if there's a company that's got, you know, torn up clothes outside, you know, that that's done for legal reasons. It's not because this company is just insidious and doesn't want people to be able to pick up the clothes and use them. There's, there's things involved here to where they kind of, they, they have to do it by law. Yeah. Why do you think there, why do you think those reasons ex- exist? Why do you think those laws exist against those businesses? It's because the government hates competition. Yeah, of course. Well, it's, yeah, they, they, they do Period. things in a way to where no one can help people except for them. A, a good example a good example happened here in Louisiana. Um, they were, uh, there was a bunch of hunters that uh, got together and uh, they brought deer meat to, uh, to give to homeless people for food. And they're like, you know, deer meat is, is great. And, you know, this would be great. You know, it would almost be like a luxury, you know? And uh, so they brought all this the deer FDA. meat. Going, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what happened because it, it's not an expected mean and the potential for disease. And it's like, yeah, but it's food. I mean. They're, they're okay with them dumpster diving, but let's not give them like, you know, right. healthy, not trash right. food. You know, and, yeah. I, and I understand, you know, sometimes wild animals carry diseases, I just, I, I'm just stuck on but the chances of that are so low that. It's a ridiculous, it's a ridiculous argument. And so they have to, I guess, throw away all the meat, you know, it was hundreds of pounds and they had no food. So it was better that they starved. I'm still stuck on Lonnie calling it Whatever. deer meat. It was in the government's eyes. It was better that they starved deer, deer meat. versus that <laughs> this they is, ate. This is what they do in Louisiana. Maybe, maybe there may have been a parasite. Well, it's like um, it's like grocery stores and the like. Uh, that's another big one. Is oh, look at all these companies throwing away all this produce. Um, a great that's another example of government regulation. At that point, most of the times they have to throw that out because if it's close to expiration or near expiration or anything like that, or there's a chance of there being anything wrong, yeah, they won't let them. They give can't it give people. it out. It's they actually can face lawsuit or legal legal repercussions for trying to give away that food. Or uh, another big one is uh, some milk uh, dairy farms are told that they have a production cap where they're only allowed to do so much because there's actual, at least in Canada, there's actual price setting that goes on where you can only have so much milk in the market because otherwise it depreciates the value of dairy and could fuck up the agriculture sector. So these people are being told, throw this stuff out because you are making too much. And because you're making too much, you're going to depreciate the value of this in a market. The fuck is that? (laughs) People kind. The worst well, kind. That's, that's Castro's son for you. People kind up there in Canada. That's Fidel Castro's son for you. <laughs> <up there. laughs> did you, you guys? Did you guys see the meme that I made? It's okay. It's okay to make Justin Castro a drama teacher again. I thought it was great. Oh God, a hundred percent. I have never. I've never met a man that has so much pomp and circumstance about trying to show that he loves everyone and yet takes so many actions against his own countrymen if it's to the benefit of everyone else because he thinks that the, the entire country up here is privileged 
Yeah, he's a shit leader, and I have no problem saying that. Everyone, make sure that you go and vote for Tim Mullen in 2019. And he's he's not even. I wouldn't even say a shit leader. He's just a shit person. Yeah, I don't use this term a lot, but uh, he is definitely a uh, he's definitely a pud whacker for sure. He is a complete pud whacker. There's no doubt about it. No, he's a total pud. He's always got that cheesy fucking look. I don't know. There's something about that guy. <laughs> those the, and those socks. I can't handle it. Man. <laughs> Fucking socks already. Please stop with the socks. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll get out of Canada politics here. But yeah, I, I agree. The, the, look, the competition makes the state irrelevant, and so they hate it, and so they have to put regulations to continue to grow themselves. That's just the that's I mean one hundred percent truth of the matter. So you bring up a good point here, and it's when you're when you're debating with someone, you're in a corner, and they're not giving you a lot of wiggle room, or they're not giving you a lot of acceptance to your ideas or grace and discourse. You know, a good solution to kind of approach things at is to to just kind of offer up the idea of competition, right? So when people get into there, well, who's going to do this and who's going to do that and who's going to do this in the absence of that? You don't even need to necessarily advocate the absence of anything because we know what happens, what will come if it's opened up to competition. But sometimes that let that be the answer. Just open it up to competition. That's that's my biggest argument. Always. It's uh, competition breeds success. We know this. Yeah. Like, like I want to see another option. Right. That's it. I just I just want to see what it would look like if someone else was able to compete in this space. Not to swing it back to Canada yeah. here, but we actually had a good example of that. Uh, back in the seventies, there's a company out here, uh, Petro Canada. Uh, basically it's a gas station chain, but originally it was owned by the government. So it was actually, uh, Trudeau senior when he was a uh, prime minister up here, he had started the whole thing and then eventually ended up selling it off to the private market. But even when it was in existence, it was still open to competition. And it was in that competition that they said, okay, you know what? It's, uh, unless we basically tell everybody what to do as far as every other business is concerned, which is just going to cause us headaches, we actually can't compete. So they ended up just selling it off. And I think that the, like the story of that is probably the best example of the government losing in market and at least admitting it. It'll definitely take less tax dollars. So, I mean, it's hard to change people's minds when you you know, call for abolishing all of these things that they rely on that they've, you know, grown accustomed to. Um, so when you open up to competition and say, Hey, you can keep your, you know, shitty post office or your shitty welfare programs, but there's going to be other people competing with it. And you might find this to be better. And if not stick with your programs, that's fine. And just, I, I think it's, it's a much better way of framing things. So. Yeah. Um, what, what I like to do in the instance of, well, who's going to do this? Who's going to build this? Who's going to, what I like to do is I ask people, well, okay, who's going to build the roads? Well, look at the roads now. Look at them. They're full of holes. So who has been doing these things? Uh, What have you been paying for this whole time? So you're paying this amount of money uh, to go to roads but clearly, it's not getting done. Or whenever it does get done, it's done bad. You know, you have these weird uh, exits that are confusing. Um, you know, uh, or who, who's gonna uh, who's gonna be the police? Well, okay, well, look at them now. You know, they're giving you tickets for too dark of window tent. They're they're doing all these things. You know, it, it's like. You have to make them see that what they've been doing this whole time hasn't been working. You know, so it's, you know, if you could show them that, um, that it, ah, shoot. You know, if you could show them that, you know, basically what's been going on has been almost a failure. It's like clearly someone is going to come up with better ideas, you know, and that's whenever you start talking about, right. That's whenever you start bringing in like the competition and, you know, things like that, you know, and usually people go, okay, I guess, you know, it kind of gets them thinking like they may not agree, but you know, they're like, yeah, I mean, I guess I could see that, you know, you bring up the post office, which I don't know. And in, in my experience, I mean, I went to UPS to, uh, 
ship uh, some vinyl records to the UK and it was going to be like $150. I went to the post office and it was 40. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. So it's comp it's competition. The post office had to get better, you know, so that's why they started doing like the flat rate boxes and, you know, just different things like that. They had to get better because, you know, people were, were going other places and, you know, they were losing money. And the benefit goes to the consumer. Right. You know, you, you were faced with, with options and you chose the option you chose. And yeah, you know, granted it was the, the option of the post office, but you went for the lowest price. Well, well, yeah, I mean, it was able to exist. I wasn't going to on principle use the private solution because, well, I mean, I wouldn't have made any money at all on the, the items that I was shipping. So in, in that one instance, the government solution actually was better for me, but that is due to the competition from UPS, from Federal Express, from DHL and the like. They had to come up with something better. You, you actually bring up a really good point when it comes to um, kind of like government incompetence and kind of going back to welfare and stuff, how I usually frame that argument is like, okay, so you really care about this, you know, where your money's going, like to these welfare programs or to whatever, you know, pick your favorite government agency. You really like these things, right? So why would you want to put your money into the government, like a middleman, and only see 40% of your money go to the things that you want it to go to when a private option, uh, nearly 100% of your money would be going to where you want it to go to. Because like with bureaucracy and regulations and all this other shit, 60% of your money gets eaten up before it even gets to the people you want it to go to. So, Sorry, you just reminded me of that point. That's a, that, that, that actually is a really good point that a lot of people don't think about is, you know, you have to, you have all of these employees and all of the benefits because I mean, if you're a government employee, I mean, you got vacation, you got insurance, you have all these benefits and you usually have a pretty decent salary, you know, and, and once you're in, it's kind of hard to get fired, you know, so the government jobs, they're actually pretty good jobs if you can get them. So that's a lot of money, you know, and a lot of times private charities, you know, uh, most of them are not a lot profit. of, uh, it's, it's a lot of, right. And it's a lot of mm -hmm. volunteer work because people want to volunteer for things. They want to go do good things. So people give money to go, uh, repair houses in let's say Haiti, well, people will volunteer to go there and the money is spent on the materials and people will go for free to go build these houses. I mean, I, I don't – it's hard to see how people just don't understand that, okay, I can have uh, more than half of my money eaten up by people who – you know, aren't going to do their job well because they're not going to get fired or I can have the majority of my money go to construction materials and all of these things or food or clothes or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, you know, you got to tell them that's, that's what it is. It's this is going on because people just don't know, you know, and you just gotta, you gotta tell them, you gotta let them know that, that this, what, this is what goes into this stuff. This is, this is how it works. You know? Yeah, one thing kind of branching off of that a little bit, when we're talking about money going towards things we don't want, such as, you know, middleman bureaucracy and stuff like that, the other thing that I find gets forgotten when you're talking to people who are very pro-government is that they seem to forget that their team doesn't always win. So, like, for example, um, look back at the Obama presidency. So when he started to override things and he had that uh, that famous quote where he's got a phone and he's got a pen and he started doing a bunch of executive orders and everything else like that, Democrats cheered him on and cheered him on and said, yeah, this is what a president should do. This is what should happen. Then Trump got in and all of a sudden the precedent was set and it was a bad thing. Do the same thing with the uh, the upscaling in uh, drone bombings because those happened. Well, those have been happening for basically a decade at this point on an ever increasing scale. Um, 
when you talk about like who you're voting for or anything like that, when you're being taxed, your money is going towards maybe the party you support at the time because they're the ones that are in power and they're doing things that you like to see them do. But it's not always going to be your party that's in power, but the bill is going to be the same. They're going to charge you the same taxes and every party is going to come up with a different reason to tax you or a different reason to take extra money off of you. So it's not even that you're paying costly for the middleman. You're paying for the middleman for things that you might not even want because it's not always your team that wins. Yeah. So let's get to removing the ability for a team to be able to win. You know what I'm saying? Um, so moving on to a, a different topic that people oftentimes bring up. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard this one, but along with the road, something that people are quick to kind of jump to when you're arguing about stuff or when you, when, you know, it gets revealed that you're a libertarian, uh, something that people like to attack is who is going to protect people from monopolies. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah. The monopolies are something that people are very worried about all the time and they're going to, they're going to let you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because you can't, you can't stop monopolies. It's like saying who can stop fires without (laughs) arsonists. Right. Right. <laughs> it's not how this works. It's not how any of this works. No, no, it's not. And so, you know, look, I implore anyone listening. First and foremost, go to Google, right? And ty- type in uh, history of, of monopolies in the United States. There's going to be like an Investopedia article that comes up and it's going to have these examples. Go ahead, read those, learn those. I think there's some Mises articles that talk about refuting those. So just get yourself ready because those are the same things that always come up all the time and pre- people bring them up. And and when they do, you know, you get used to the fact that people aren't really arguing from a place where they know a lot about what they're talking about. They're just Googling something and they're looking for the first thing that pops up so they can use it as an argumentation. But if you if you look at instances where companies actually got big enough to be considered a monopoly or something where people actually bring this up, you know, there's one in the Investopedia. I think there's two in the Investopedia articles and there's one that everyone goes to, which is like Microsoft. So you've got these situations that are essentially companies got so big because they were able to offer such a high quality product to users at such a low price by making all of their processes and workflows super efficient that they just became really popular and they they gobbled up a bunch of market share because it was the, the consumer preference. Right. And you've got this company just like like Microsoft. Right. They've, they've essentially went and found a way to give people computers at a, at a price, at a cost that made it essentially cap- possible for everyone in America or most people in America to have a computer in their living room. Right. And so this this is what we're complaining about. This is what you're now hinging your argument on is these these horrible companies that have gotten so big because they do such a good job at providing good quality products to consumers at prices that they can afford that it's going to be used as a point to why you need government to protect you from these companies that are offering you these things that 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 customers obviously want and are made affordable because of the way that the the companies produce them doesn't make any sense doesn't make any sense at all heaven forbid right yeah, heaven forbid that a company comes along and they they hit the top where they're the basically the only game in town because they offer the absolute best quality at the absolute lowest price and absolutely no one can come near them. Oh, woe is the consumer. Right. What a what a bum deal. You know, so this is one of those things when you're if you're talking to someone and again, I'll point out like you don't always have to take the anarchist standpoint, right? If you can just get someone to kind of start to see the idea that liberty leads to to good results, like leave the companies alone, maybe go out of your way to protect consumers and to protect workers. Right. And and so these these companies can't do unethical things in in those ways. And then if they get big because they're successful, then that's fine. And you're not really in the business of of knocking down companies just because they got to a size that you're uncomfortable with. Well, you sound like you're just a corporate apologist. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that is what you hear in response to that is, you know, you're just a corporatist or you just like the rich people and all that kind of stuff. How does that boot taste? <laughs> right. But then, I mean, look, then you can turn around and ask them, like, when was the last time that you took advantage of the services offered by these companies that everyone's so quick to demonize? Chances are pretty recently. Yeah. I, I mean, look, Amazon, Amazon is doing all kinds of stuff. You know, they're, they're cha- they're changing the game. I mean, they're getting to the point where some cities, they have drones that deliver. So they're bypassing, uh, 
UPS, uh, the uh, the post office, everything. They're just dropping it off via drone. You know, it, it's amazing. I mean, Amazon is going to go so far, and if Jeff <laughs> Bezos gets a chance to elect himself king of the world, <laughs> that would be great. I would be completely fine with that if if it was just like if we changed the name of the world from Earth to Prime World, that would be okay. I mean, I would be completely fine with that. I love Amazon. Amazon is like Jeff my Bezos favorite company in the world. All foods yeah. is great too. Yeah. If you have the money to spend, <laughs> it's it amazing. Nah, dude, it's great. Uh, Whole Foods you're, you're sucks. Wrong. You're very but, wrong. Uh, no, no, so check this out. Like my my sister, she she travels a lot for her work or or, or for whatever, right? So she just went up north for a bit here in uh, Josh's backyard, and and she was telling me that there's this like prime pantry place here that she went to, and like most of the thing is automated. It was super fast. It was super convenient. She was able to run in, get what she needed. She like used her Amazon info to make it quick and to make it easy. Um, and you got that like one touch purchase stuff and all that. And it was just a really like seamless and easy experience. And it was, wasn't a hassle. It didn't take a whole bunch of time. She was able to get what she needed, you know, get in there and get out. And it, and, and it was all just made way easier by this, you know, phenomenon that is Amazon. Right. This is uh, this is peak yeah. convenience here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're like, they're like, okay. Well, you just go in and you just get your stuff and you walk out. And I'm just like, well, I've been doing that at stores. Just go in. Call me. No, they they've been setting up these stores too. Uh, someplace I can't remember. Was it in Was it in Europe or somewhere? No, I think it was here where they had that store where people come in and take what they want and then um, pay what they can afford. Doesn't Bon Jovi have, have a restaurant like that? Happening? Yes. I yes. think he does. Yeah. 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 I'm going to, I'm going to say something's going to piss a lot of leftists off right now. You could thank capitalism yeah. for that. There's no doubt. 100%. That's capitalism. We have, we have more than we need. And so we can give it to other people. Cause you know, since, uh, you know what I mean? Bon Jovi charity. He's a cowboy. I mean, what, what was it? Uh, um, Steel Steel Steel. Steel. <laughs> yeah, I get out of here. Uh, what was it? I think. Uh, <laughs> I think. It, <laughs> I think it was Radiohead oh, that. Um, well, just hold on. I think it was Radiohead that one of their albums they it was just offered just right off of their website, and you could just pay what you want. A dollar, five dollars, you know. It, it, the point is with that is that sometimes these these companies get to such a point that they can operate in those kind of models. Is that you know you can set up a store where um it, it can operate like that. Well, you know, okay, well you can pay what you can afford. You know, well, all I have is ten dollars. You know, but I know I can go here and get the food I need for my week. But I do have to pay something. You know, and I'm sure they probably have some sort of way of verifying that. The way people don't just you know go and you know just get uh, a month's worth of food for fifteen bucks and you know, but um, you know they they get to such a point you know, through capitalism and through their own drive and their success to where they can start giving things away and it does not hurt them. And that, that is the point that I think a lot of people in their own personal finances want to get to, to where they can have enough money to where they can start helping others. Well, companies do the same thing where they can set up charitable models, they can set up charitable stores, they can set up you know, foundations, different kind of things in order to help other people because human beings, despite having their own self-interest being number one, helping others is usually number two or number three on that list. So it's in us to aid others, to help others, to provide um to build roads you know even for free if we have to because we have to get somewhere i i I mean it's human nature and i think a lot of people uh they just 
don't they don't understand that they don't understand that people want to do good things I, and sometimes I, I if they have a lot of extra money they'll put gold flakes on ice cream oh yeah do yeah, too <laughs> man yeah you know, I, I'm sorry. I didn't. I, I, I hate to just totally derail it, but we, you know, we go and we talk about like we were with opening competition. I've just been sitting here thinking the whole time, like like the DMV, like how much of what goes on at the DMV, like not even that. Like, there's more that you can do online that would be useful at the DMV than than what they have you go in to do. Well, a lot of states, a lot of states yeah. actually. Like, I know Louisiana has a good bit of stuff that's done online, but I'm glad you brought up the DMV because that is another thing that I usually ask people, you know, when they're like, Oh, well the government should handle, you know, healthcare and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, have you ever been to the DMV? Oh, I hate going to the DMV. Okay. Now imagine the DMV, but you're bleeding. <laughs> that's good. I like that. Jesus. What are you, how about you, Killian? What do they do down there in uh, Canada for the DMV? Is it is it as bad out there as it is over here? Do you need a reindeer license? Yeah, does Santa just bring you <laughs> registration? How does that work? <laughs> the Santa bring <brand. laughs> or, or is it like just like a Mountie shows up? And just, Hello, Canadian citizen. I have your license here. <laughs> I've come to wish you tidings and oh give you your <laughs> registrations. <laughs> so, I just need a moment to take in your utter racism against the great people of the North. Killian, do you need a license for a sled? For a dog uh, sled? Do you need a license are, for a dog sled? We are not the UK. Uh, we don't need a license for our licenses. Um... As far as the uh, as far as like driver's license and the like, it's pretty much the same thing. Except ours are pretty quick. It's really the only time I've had to redo a license <laughs> or anything like that or renew anything. It, it takes I'm me in and out in like maybe fifteen to minutes. 10 weeks to get my just, license in the mail. Yeah, most of us just fill out a form, hand it over, call it a day. Yeah. So check this out. The other day before work, now I got to, I, I normally I leave for work pretty early. So I figure, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get up extra early. I'm going to get there. DMV opens at eight. And so I figure I'll get there at seven o'clock. I'll be there nice and early and I'll be able to take care of anything that I need to go get taken care of at the DMV. So I get my things together. I get out there and I, I, I get there at about seven o'clock. And by the time I get there at seven o'clock, there are people outside in lawn chairs. <laughs> Sitting in lawn chairs, line is around the corner, and the beginning of the line starts in lawn chairs. Just unreal. What a, what is it Black Friday or a, a release on some new Jordans? <laughs> I mean, what what is going on? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like they must have been there like six in the morning, just waiting. I want the Christmas mounting. Yeah, I've, like I, I've seen that on like if it's really busy, I've seen it like maybe take that long. But like we have a thing uh, at least here. We've got it. Uh, Service Ontario is what it's called here. And it's not just the DMV. No, 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 no. Uh, it's DMV. It's also where you do uh, applications for passports. It's where you do pretty much everything that involves handing the government money that they're not just taking from you when you buy stuff or off of your paycheck. It's pretty much where you go to settle everything else up. Uh, renewing health cards because we've got our stupid socialized medicine up here, which works exactly like the American DMV. It's really weird. Like our office, that's basically the closest to your version of the DMV. We're in and out super quick. It's nice and easy, very painless. And then you go to a hospital up here and it's like, hey, uh, you're bleeding out of three organs and you got four things broken. Um, oh, but this guy's got a cold and he's over 65. So just sit in the, just sit there. We'll get to you within the next four hours. Like I, I've been to the hospital and I waited four to six hours to get treated for something. Free's not worth it if you're going to die in the meantime. Oh well, that that sounds like exactly yeah, at least everyone's going to get the United seen, States you know? should go do. Yeah, that, that sounds like a fantastic idea. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are about at our limit. So, speaking of fantastic ideas, I, I do like this conversation. So, we'll call this part one uh, of of this topic, and we'll see if we can't. Uh, get this group together and go on and continue this conversation on our next episode here next week. So with that, I want to thank everyone listening for their time and please um, make some time for us next week as we, again, uh, continue this conversation here. We'll go with a part two 
of uh, libertarian arguments. And until then, whether or not anybody likes it, we'll probably be back again. <laughs>